in solving social, social and economic problems. So I'm I'm here today to share um, some stories and to talk to you about what is being called for as a new kind of higher education. I'm going to ask you some questions as we go. And if you would answer in the chat, I, I will want to look at that as time goes on. And certainly if you have questions, put them in the chat. And I um, ask that my host um, wave at me or or interrupt so I can answer questions as we go. I want to, um, I believe, oh, let me go back to this. Mm -hmm, just a sec here to go back to the beginning. I want to, um, I believe very much in the value of social presence when you are working remotely and in technologically mediated environments. So let me start by telling you a story of how it is I became involved in technology for education. The first course that I taught using technology was by teleconference in 1996. It was quite by accident. I had just finished my PhD program and my supervisor saw me in the hallway and stopped me and asked me if I wanted to teach research methods to the master's level students. Of course, I said, yes, I'm so excited. I, I, I'm honored that you would want me to teach graduate students. So she gave me some brief directions and I began my planning. About three weeks before the course was about to start, she stopped me in the hallway again and said, by the way, has anyone told you that this course is being offered by teleconference? And do you know what my answer was? What's that? I had no idea. Of course, I had heard about it and I knew some people were using it. But I, of course, was not going to give up my opportunity and I had to rush to prepare. The, it was a new medium for me and the students. The university where I studied decided to extend its reach and offer the graduate research methods course via teleconference never before done at this university. The first thing I did was go to the bridge operator. If some of you have been around as long as I have, you may know what that is. That's a person that plugs the wires in to make sure all those calling in can hear each other. And they have to manually do all that and they stay online for the whole course. They, the whole lecture time because they want to make sure the technology works. But the, other than that, I started to look for things the students would be familiar with. Email was available at that time, but not everyone had it. So I very quickly arranged for all of the students who were registered to go on email. That's how early we were in the process. We connected via email and I made sure everyone had instructions about how to dial in, how to call in, some instructions about how to act, how to mute, etc. But the most important thing that I learned from this is that a particular need emerged among these 20 students that had never worked remotely before. They wanted to meet me and they wanted to meet each other. So I'm very student centered. And I said, I will ask, I called the course coordinator and they said, we don't have space for you to meet. Space was very limited and 
we want the students to get used to operating remotely. Well, the students were insistent and one of them took the lead, arranged for um, a room in a restaurant and we all met to, to start the course so we could all be together for even just a brief amount of time to see each other and so on. That course was definitely an experience that I still remember all the time. For me and the students, it was a totally new way of being with each other. But we were in it together. I made sure they understood that, that it was a purposeful community for all of us to work on the processes we needed to be connected, not not only to each other, but to the content as well. And that purposeful community provided a rich, fertile ground for us to be teaching and learning together. It wasn't called blended learning then, but in the tradition of good education, I used all the things that were available to create engagement, access, and relationality for me and for the students. And I've been working on student-centered, multimodal, community-based teaching and learning ever since. And while I appreciate that you have heard about the other honors that I've had and the research that I do, mm -hmm. but at base, I'm just a teacher. I'm, I'm a teacher who wants to create the highest amount of learning for all the diverse types of students that come to our courses. And I hope that you will reflect on that and consider if that's your orientation as well. So, well, since that time in the late 90s, technologies have continued to grow. The information explosion combined with this and meant that we needed to revise in-person place-based teaching. Um, well, our numbers have increased dramatically since that time, and the diversity among our students has widened. These learning environments, once limited by space, time, and simple technologies, are no longer constrained in the same way. The pandemic has taken what many of us have been experimenting with for decades and pushed it into the limelight. Blended learning, however, is so named to represent an education evolution that is now an imperative. In, in concept and practice, um, blending learning has also changed over time. And I, I want to talk with you about what happened during the pandemic, how it's so different. Um, although it has aspects of blended learning, it is not the same. And while we can build on that, we can also build on the many things that were happening before the pandemic. So let's briefly talk about the, this post-pandemic context. I hope we're post-pandemic, I'm going to be optimistic. Um, and then I want to put aside the pandemic as just one experience of many for those of us in education. The pandemic really highlighted for us that one size fits all education approaches fail to address the student needs. Higher education's mostly adult learners value the convenience of connecting with classmates and instructors online during times of their choosing. This is only a benefit where inequality, like poor access to the internet, lack of financial resources, and needed digital competence are addressed through multimodal learning, financial support structures, and support orientation to how to be a digital learner, how to learn online. So emergency online education that was created during the pandemic used 
blunt edged instruments um, without attention to diverse student needs and program uniquenesses. The pandemic takeaway for all of us, however, is the importance of preparing students to learn. And that should be our orientation, whether it's online or in a physical classroom or both. Technological tools combined with independent and collaborative working opportunities should be brought back into the physical and hybrid classroom in conjunction with online pedagogical opportunities that increase active collaborative learning and learner generated, generated choices. I wanna say something that I think is the most important thing for us to consider post pandemic. Online learning is best designed when pedagogical models different than teacher led content centered approaches of traditional lecture based delivery. Um, blended learning requires a new approach to how we work with our students, how we deal with the material, the kinds of assessment that we use. Online models drawn from more active, constructed, learner-centered, flexible approaches transfer to place-based learning much easier than lecture-based, teacher-led, passive student models of, the, of those lectures transfer online. And that I suggest is one of the biggest challenges we had with the pandemic. We tried to take, or many of us tried to take what we were doing in lecture halls and in the classroom and just chunk it over to using the technology and without consideration for the skills of the students, their individual needs, um, and working on it together, we, we, did, we did stay safe and we shared some content knowledge, but it was for many in the midst of um, many pedagogical, um, social and economic challenges. So what can we do instead? I want to point you toward um, this work by, um, by Gallagher and colleagues. These, these are people who have written now higher education's response to the COVID-19 pandemic, and then building a more sustainable and democratic future through this education. Um, I have one quote that I wanted to share on the slide, but I'm gonna read you something else that they also said, because it highlights what I think is critical toward the university of the future. So first this, the idea of an academic competence and a commitment to the public good. Okay, I, I picked this quote because of this. The end users of our higher education systems is the society at large. Of course, we're preparing individuals. And of course, we want them to be content ready. They need to have a knowledge base, but they also have to be competent digital learners and come out of higher education with social and economic perspectives on how the greater good must come together and how the world works. It is through this public good that we come together to build a future that will be marked by, by the experience of the, of the pandemic, but will also surpass that experience, a future in which reflection and action reinforce rather than separate each other and contribute to a more sustainable and democratic future. So I encourage you to, um, Take a look at this book. Uh, in my memory, it is open source. So there are some other things going on that some of you may be aware of, some may not. 
the International Commission on the Futures of Education acknowledges the power of education to bring about profound change. Right now, we face the dual challenge of making good on unfulfilled promises to make sure that the right to a quality education for every child, youth and adult, um, to, will fully realize the, the potential of education. For us to have sustainable collected futures, um, we need a new social contract between education and society so that we can repair the injustices, the social and economic challenges that your, uh, the wonderful doctor who, who opened our session today referred to. That's just one significant injustice and an area where there's a significant need for transformation. There are many more. The digital transformation, as it says in this report, which is also open source, by the way, you'll have a copy of my slides. And if you just click on that slide, you will get this report. Digital transformation for our societies, they say, are impacting our lives in unprecedented ways. We all know that. Computers are changing the way knowledge is created, accessed, disseminated, validated, and used. Much of this making information more accessible and opening new and promising avenues for education is occurring. But the risks are many. So while I know this workshop is about how we can, as teachers and learning designers, improve how students can access the, the dramatic and important learning events in their lives, there are many things in the, in the hidden curriculum that need to be addressed. Learning can narrow as well as expand in digital spaces. Technology provides new levers of power and control, but that can repress as well as emancipate. And in the facial recognition and AI, our human rights to privacy can contract in ways that are currently unimaginable. So we need to be vigilant to ensure that ongoing technical transformations help us thrive and do not threaten the future of diverse ways of knowing or of intellectual and creative freedom. They also refer to our, our need to graduate people from education who understand how important it is to relate to and care for others regardless of gender, race, or any other things that have in the past separated us. And most importantly, I'm going to suggest the care of the planet. For them, the International Commission on the Future of Education, without considering what's happening to our planet, there will be a lot of things we won't have to worry about because we, it's un, we will be unsustainable. Okay, let's talk about digital learning. Oh, but first, a question for you. Um, I want to play with the temporal sequence a little. So let's take a long view in reference to making choices and identifying changes for teaching and learning. As we use this multimodal delivery post pandemic and beyond, I suggest that this is the question that should be on your mind, whether you're a leadership, administration, a teacher, a learning designer. How will you be designing and delivering courses three to five years from now? The tendency is to look at all of this in reference to your past and current experiences, consider an, instead a future view. 
what is it that we want to accomplish through our teaching in order to continue to increase access, embrace diverse learners, and prepare them to live in an increasingly complex, digital, technologically mediated world. The, the question on your mind as you reflect on the history, the benefits and challenges of blended technologically enhanced learning um, is that you also consider not just your content, which I know is important and I would never wanna suggest that you dismiss that, but rather that we also consider the development of the person at the same time so that they can be lifelong learners. So I'm, I just wanna do a check here and make sure that you can still hear me. So I'm gonna ask that someone in the chat put, um, put a note up to say that you can, yes, I see a yes, we can hear, you can still hear me. Good, my microphone is not showing um, that it's active. So this is good. Thank you. Now I am back. Now I need to get rid of the chat. Do going up here. Okay, let's talk about digital for a minute. What does that mean? So I'm, I brought for you today because we have such a small amount of time, the, the people working on and describing this that I think have the most, the clearest idea for us. So Ramada's discussion of education with and education about digital is a key consideration. We currently have to think clearly about um, digital competencies of our students. For Romanda and his colleagues, a school or institution's mission must be development of personalities, of persons able to shape political and social life on the basis of democracy, peace, freedom, human dignity, equality of genders, and in harmony with nature and the environment. This is in keeping with UNESCO's recent request for a new social contract as we, we as educators must consider how education with digital can accomplish these same ends. Let's try using Hermanda's definition to shape our thinking. The task of digital education, he says, is to maximize force of judgment, in-depth knowledge, skillful expertise, and personal integrity of voluntarily learning by means not of remote teaching and learning, but well thought, future oriented, cognition enhancing, humanist curricula involving education about digital and education with digital methodologies. Now we've looked at the present, we've looked at our current view, um, and uh, we've, we're, I'm suggested we're gonna orient ourselves to the future. However, 
those who don't address the history are are deemed um, are at risk of repeating it. So come with me and let's look back for a few minutes to see what was being said two decades ago before a pandemic, as we were just beginning to look at higher education and say, you know, we don't have the right match anymore to the complex society that's emerged. So here are a couple of the thought leaders from two decades ago. So Ickenberry, for example, told us in colleges and universities that we have to start reorganizing ourselves, our policies have to change, our culture, what faculty do, the way we work, and those we serve. He was predicting the, the um, increase in enrollments we were going to have and the diversity that uh, they, were, they were going to represent. Then Darren Dorf, some of you may know as a philosopher, said this. He's not being very um, polite. He said, stagnant universities are expensive and ineffectual monuments to a status quo that's more likely to be status quo ante. Yesterday's world preserved in aspic jello is what he means. And then finally, Pond said, look, and this is true right now, today, although he was saying it 20 years ago, neither the purpose, the methods, the population for whom education is intended today bear any resemblance to those for which we, we created traditional universities and colleges in history. So we were being called to change long before the pandemic is my point. Now, I really like this slide. <laughs> I've been using it for some time. This work comes from um, James Duderstadt, past president of the University of Michigan, who's been writing about higher education for a little over a decade. These elements that I've identified on this slide are what Derendorf told us were significant demands for change in higher education because our societies were changing. We had to consider the impact the information explosion, rising costs, changing student characteristics, global migration, delocalization de of education through technology, increased competition for students, 21st century skill development, employment sector change, increasing accountability, and most importantly, a call for quality teaching and relevant learning. So I'd add to Duderstadt's view that while he said we have to look at each one of these things and make changes, he didn't talk enough about how making a change in one area was going to impact a lot of other areas as well. We need to take a systems view to what we're going to do. Now, um, one of the problems with suggestions from recent research um, about blending the technology with in-person environments, that there has been research from one of my colleagues, Ron Austin, um, and a student in York, and also in a major EDUCAUSE study um, is the reference to activities that are based primarily on behaviorist, content-focused, transmission method, lecture-based delivery. That high-quality online learning uses technological affordance, affordances to engage learners in active pedagogical approaches. 
these enhance effort and the opportunity for deeper applied learning. Where earlier teaching requirements focused on content, if you're going to move to a blended and online learning environment, you need to consider process. And um, the, the a blended learning is designed blended and I use that as a way to suggest we do something different post pandemic. It has to be able to support flexibility and personalization um, opportunities for students to make choices about how and when they want to learn. Um, activity monitoring by the teacher using learning analytics and electronic assignment submissions. What the students do when they are in person, and I, you will never have me suggesting that just online is the perfect model. If you can't get to education, if you can't, um, if you don't have the time or the money to come in person, and that's all that's available, fine. However, there are things that happen in in-person environments that make a blend very valuable. What the student does while they're in person has to be linked to what they're gonna do online and vice versa. So well-timed feedback balanced with supported learner independence. So I'm gonna say that again, well-timed feedback balanced with supported learner independence is a keystone of successful online and blended learning. So this is this all of this was emerging before the pandemic, and now there's a lot more attention being focused on it. That's great. But I want to say this as well for those of us who had moved over to the distance education space to look at issues of, I went to the distance education space so I could look more carefully at issues of inequity and resolutions to reaching students that can't make it to place-based institutions and ways to make that distance education as engaging and meaningful as possible. This is before the technology was as robust as it is now. So the move into online learning from a distance education perspective is much different than if you move into online learning from a lecture-based, place-based, face-to-face environment. What, what's different? Well, if you are a were a distance educator, you had to work on processes that engaged your distant learners. The teacher had to be embedded in the material. You had to work to make those connections with the students. Whereas understandably, in a lecture environment where you've got 300 students, you're focused on the content and the most reasonable ways to get all this content delivered. There is a model that has emerged through the distance education spaces that now over a 20 year period has become the most researched and applied model of online and blended learning. Let me, that's the, this is one of the most important gifts I think I, I might be able to give you. The model is called the Community of Inquiry. Um, it was designed by my mentor, Dr. Randy Garrison. And I want to tell you that what he was really committed to was very much John Dewey's approach to education because John Dewey started the process of not ignoring or dismissing completely behaviorist approaches, but rather 
was convinced that education was failing many students because we were making a categorical mistake that what we were doing was spoon feeding the products of inquiry that we worked on, that we shaped, that we then shared with the students, rather than giving them the raw material, the subject matter that they could then inquire on and try to get students to work on processes and solutions rather than just rather than just digest the material and be able to feed it back to us. So I'm going to talk about the community of inquiry. Um, it was identified just a couple of years ago to be um, a significant pivotal contribution um, as a theoretical foundation. Um, and it seems that in, in theoretically speaking of what counts pedagogically in online and blended learning, the community of inquiry and its three elements um, has had the highest impact. Um, the three elements are cognitive presence, social presence, and teaching presence. The value of the community of inquiry lies in its potential to provide effective learning experiences in computer-based online education spaces. That's where it started being employed now in in-person, fully in-person, fully online and blended environments as well. I would really like to know um, how many of you, if, if you can, um, well, uh, we, we will talk about this in a minute after I go over the model. I want to know how many of you have, are aware of this model and how many have used it. So here's the very famous Venn diagram. Here are the definitions of those three key elements deemed to be most important in bringing students together with a teacher or teachers um, so that they can work together. These elements at their intersection are meant to create the most meaningful and deep education experience. And I have some of the foundational research actually from my PhD research and others. If you want to know more about how we landed here, you can send me an email and we'll have a discussion about that. In the meantime, let me define each of these elements for you. So in our interests of having a new pedagogy, we wanna give students the opportunity to be socially present with their other students. It's defined as the ability of participants to identify with the community, with their fellow students, um, to communicate purposefully in a trusting environment and develop interpersonal relationships by way of projecting their individual selves. Um, so to be, to be personal, but not private, that's not what it means. You don't, you know, share your deepest secrets and all of that, but just to be a real person. And of course, in this model, the teachers are to do the same, to be real, to be authentic, to share the facts of your life, if not the problems and challenges. From this base of a relational environment, um, everyone takes the, the oath um, to be cognitively present. Cognitive present is defined as the extent to which learners are able to construct and confirm meaning through sustained reflection and discourse in a critical community of inquiry. This means 
there has to be opportunity for dialogue, which um, in asynchronous online digital environments can be supported in a different way than what might happen in a lecture hall. And the, the teachers need to be cognitively present as well. So rather than, which many of us do already, rather than just sharing the knowledge that's in the, um, out in the public now to um, reflect on it, share where you think it has shortcomings, where it works, and to um, be explicit about the reflections that you do and the ways in which you talk about it to yourself um, and to others. Those are really important examples for a teacher to present and the content expert, which you are, um, to show the students how you deliberate around the material. The third element is the most important one. It's called teaching presence. And there's a reason why it's not called teacher presence. Of course, you as the instructor are the leader. You are responsible for the marking, for making sure that the objectives are met, for meeting the accreditation requirements if you're in a professional program. However, in, in supporting students in their active, engaged learning, we want to give them a role to play in designing, facilitating, and directing the course. It's so much fun. It is so much fun. Now, do you have the final say to make sure you're covering content that meets the objectives? Of course, but you can ask the students to give you ideas about how. How do we get there? We have to master this content. How's the best way? What kind of design can we have? They can be part of the facilitation. Some will read more readily than others. Some will be more interested than others. They can support their fellow students. They can um, help draw them in and engage them. And then finally, of course, there's some, some direction. We, we all do this already. You give students the opportunity to lead a class, to do a presentation um, and share the their ways of being socially and cognitively present with the others. So it's meant to be a very simple model and a very simple diagram, but I can tell you it does get, it starts to get complicated. Let's try and go through some of this in the little bit of time we have together today. Each of these presences has sub elements, of course, subcategories of activities. For social presence, you want to um, offer, embrace, model, open communication. You want to provide the opportunity for students to be together, get to know each other, have work together. Um, the strength of any structure is based on how the elements in that structure are connected. And the stronger those connections, the stronger the group. So if you think of it that way, um, it's a way of having these temporary communities. These are communities that will only be together for a period of time. But that doesn't mean that you can't come together and be strong together. Um, there are lots of examples of that. At another time, perhaps we'll get together again and I can teach you more, tell you more, work with you more and hear your stories about group cohesion. The other issue is supporting, acknowledging and modeling interpersonal expression. You want people um, to tell others what they're thinking and how they're feeling um, as an individual and that needs to be acknowledged and supported. Under cognitive presence, very simply, again, we all do this kind of thing. You offer a trigger event, something to read, some, a video to look at, an example, a problem. 
then you explore that the concepts and, and issues there just as a case. And then you integrate that into current knowledge and their own context. Um, and then finally, draw the, draw the unit to a close, close it with instructions about how to learn more, how to put it to rest, et cetera. And then finally, teaching presence, which I've already said, has to do with design and organization, facilitation of discourse, and direct instruction. So I'm going to go a little further into teaching presence to say some more about how you can evaluate yourself in terms of what you're already doing. You may already be using a community of inquiry. That would be great. But even if not, um, there are things you are likely doing that already represent these kind of activities. And I have some assessment tools that I'm going to direct you to. But right now, I've been talking way too long. I don't believe in lecture delivery. So I'm going to stop for a moment and mute my mic, have a drink of water, and ask um, the host to ask me any questions that have come up, if any. And if not, I'm going to ask you some questions. Okay, this is Mary Jo Parker with the University of Houston downtown. She he's right on me. I'm thinking. Uh, and my question is this, um, well, one, I, I want to tell you about uh, an example of uh, COI, and then I want you to share with me an example that you've put together. So we have a summer program for STEM majors, pre-college, new undergrads, and uh, upper division undergrads, and professors. And so we, we find ourselves in that uh, uh, Venn diagram in the middle all the time because they're working in multi-age groups and then they're, they're discussing during a working lunch and then go back. So I'll leave it there and then you can share with me. So that sounds like a wonderful example. And do you feel that you are using the elements as needed or do you have something you could add to shape the model well i think we do use the elements i mean we're an hsi msi institution and we recruit from the greater houston area 13 counties and so we are very diverse in who comes who, who applies to the program uh, we have female STEM PhDs, male STEM PhDs, Hispanics. Uh, I won't say, well, we do have an African-American we've had in there before, but we're, we're very diverse as well. Uh, so I do think uh, we're very sensitive uh, to the culturality, if I can make up a new word, and, and to the gender issue, especially because it's STEM. Uh, and then, of course, the content we want, absolutely, we want them to hands-on in the different arenas of lab exercises we have. That sounds like a wonderful example and a case that I hope you'll write up and, and share in the literature. So what can you tell me what you believe the outcomes are? It is a lot of work, isn't it, to bring small communities together? and to have them working together um, rather than just providing information and testing them on it. What do you think the benefits, the outcomes have been of your case? Uh, well, I know some of the outcomes are, uh, because we, we've done this for three years, 
uh, we get transition or matriculation into the university from not all the pre-college, but, and we go into it with that as an objective. And uh, for the undergrads, we see them uh, connecting with the professors, which they hadn't, that's their first opportunity to do research, mentored research. Right. Uh, and that was a, a, an objective we went into because it was grant funded. And then the olders, the upper division, uh, we see that as experience, like a lab assistant. I want, don't want to go that far because then it incurs wages, but they get a stipend. Uh, but they get jobs as a result of this experience. They put it on their CV. So those are some tangibles. Now, the intangibles, we do a uh, survey on attitude, survey on interest. Uh, so we, we try to look at uh, many elements, but I don't want to dominate. I want to give others a chance. Well, thank you very much. What a great story. And um, I, you have reminded me how often in these kinds of programs and again in distance ed where I've had a lot of experience and in new online programs where you so often get first generation post-secondary um, members of the family where they're, you know, what you just said about how valuable it is for them to connect with their instructors. Um, they may not have a lot of experience of, of being with or talking with people who have higher levels of education. And that can be scary and daunting. And um, the, the, that's a great experience. OK, mm -hmm. other um, questions or case suggestions? Okay, OK, so one other thing, speaking of the parents, in this program, we bring, now it is only one day, but we bring them in for a showcase. So uh, imagine posters, printed posters all around, and they're able to talk to their own student, talk to other students, talk to upper division. It's an amazing sight, just amazing. Wonderful. Well, it sounds like an outstanding case. I'd love to hear more about it. There's some, um, a group at the uh, University of California Riverside who are working on creating something similar. So um, it might be an interesting thing for um, the, the woman who runs that program and you um, to, to have a connection together. We need to, uh, I'm looking to find ways to construct communities of inquiry about the university and college of the future so that examples like this can be passed on and ways of doing it can be shared. So other comments or questions? Oh, I did see a hand go up, but I don't know if you're gonna put it in the chat. Hi, everyone. If you can use the chat, the ones that are virtually, it will be great. And I will be gladly reading your comments or questions, OK? Please, because we don't want to, the audio is kind of hectic, and we don't want to uh, cause a feedback uh, issue, OK? So please use the chat, and I'll be reading your uh, questions or comments to Martha. Stuff, OK? Okay, so I, uh, I will continue, um, but I look forward to, it's hard for me to get to the chat and pay attention to my slides as well. So I look forward to, um, to having those things read and questions asked. So last year, I wrote a chapter in a book for, um, um, Betham and Sharp were the editors, and it's called Rethinking Pedagogy um, for a New Education. So one of the things that I offered were some really concrete examples of how we make the, the sub-elements of each of the presences 
come to life in the classroom, whether it's online or it's um, or in person or a blend, which is so much fun. So um, some years ago now, we have created an instrument that um, offers 32 indicators of the different presences, 32 in total, um, so that we could use it to test to see if communities of inquiry were emerging. And that instrument has been tested and retested and validated and shaped so that it's, it's quite finely tuned now. Is it perfect? Well, you can't ask me because I've been working on it for too long, um, but it's, it's a valuable assessment tool. So what we did with that assessment tool that was written from the student voice is we rewrote it from the teacher's perspective. So here are three indicators from the teacher's point of view that they are um, offering design and organization, but also engaging the students. Um, so the, 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 the first indicator of design and organization is to clearly communicate important due dates, timeframes um, for the learning activities and stay true to that um, so that the students can trust that what you say is what actually is going to happen. Um, it, instructors trying to make that design explicit clearly communicate important course goals. And then finally, um, communicating ahead of time the, the important course topics also builds on that design and makes an environment that is um, knowable and expandable. So you, you can do this to help support your community of inquiry and engage the the students in it as well. What are the actual activities that you do for this? Well, there's put a course calendar online and make sure that there's the opportunity for the students to identify what's going to happen when. You can put up Twitter reminders and you can ask the students to support each other, to remind them about dates and, um, uh, and, and uh, you know, retweet the reminders, et cetera. Give them an opportunity to also shape the structure of, uh, of running the course. Um, so clearly communicating important course goals have a couple of pieces to it. So where possible, where possible, and I know that sometimes there's accreditation, there's requirements that are unequivocal and they can't be shaped. But even when you have course goals that you have to meet, you can also add some. Maybe you can't change them or, or, or delete any of them, but you could add them. So one of the possibilities in clearly communicating these important goals is to go that next step and, um, and ask students what their goals are, which many of you may do already, and see if you can shape the course so that some of those goals are included. And then finally, um, clearly communicating those important course topics, make the syllabi explicit, more than the course outline. It's not just about, if that course outline is just about the content and the very uh, and the fixed activities, ask the students to um, add to that course outline or the syllabi that links to materials with ideas about how to work with those materials. You can make that um, what you want, of course, is to allow them to have some to have some investment in not just being there and getting the credits and getting through, but rather some investment in building the experience. 
for themselves and for the others. Facilitation has different indicators. So facilitating learning are those pedagogical processes that teachers use to help students engage with the material. It's not just direct instruction where you actually tell them or test them about the material, which you still have to do. Um, so the first indicator under facilitation of teaching presence is to ask yourself if the students in your course feel comfortable at times taking on the role of teacher when the opportunity arises. Will they do a presentation for you? Will they bring some new material and share it with you and the other students? Will they do, are they empowered? Are they empowered to shape their own learning experiences and those of others? Um, and you can do that by brainstorming and agreeing to interact um, and creating activity norms. If you don't do this, I highly recommend it. There are actually two things that I highly recommend. The first thing I teach now in under direct instruction when I start a course is the community of inquiry. So that the students understand that my expectation is that they're gonna be active and they're gonna play an, an active role in participating and contributing to the course. Then the second thing I always do now because there is group work in a community, you're going to have to communicate. You're going to have to be true to your word and um, and support the community rather than just um, sitting quietly and drinking in the content, which some will do anyway. So we set the norms. What I ask students to do when we first all meet is this. Think back to a communal experience you've had getting something done. It might be, I don't know, landscaping a yard or cleaning up a park or anything that they might be involved in and ask them, what were the rules? What rules were at play when you came together as that community to make that happen? So then you make a list of six or eight agreements that all of the students can live with, even if they don't always agree with all of them, so that you know they can come into a trusting environment knowing what the rules are. We respect each other's opinions. Um, we come ready to participate. We start on time. We, um, we, we work to do to put our assignments in on time. What the things that they want and the things that you want. Okay, next one is I keep course participants engaged and participating in productive dialogue. I, I would strongly recommend that you look up the definition of deliberative dialogue. It's described as something different than debate, different than trying to prove each other's wrong, having the one right answer, but rather taking Finding the good as when it's possible, which it almost always is, finding the good or the value in what someone has said, what everyone has said, and weaving tapestries of understanding that brings people's voices together rather than having one right answer and trying to prove each other wrong, which is the, the effort of debate. Now, I know we could have our own debate about with the value of this, there sometimes there is one right answer. And, and I do teach statistics and I understand how important it is that you don't try to mess too much with a regression equation. However, it makes people feel safer if your dialogue is about building rather than looking for gaps and falsehoods that you, you look, you scrape, you dig and find what is truthful and meaningful um, and a 
and pieces of what people say. So in trying to get course participants engaged and participating in productive dialogue, you need to um, acknowledge and support them when they do, uh, they do offer something. So I make the COI premises explicit and I uh, acknowledge and encourage learning activities where the students feel um, that their contributions are valued. Um, the next one, I'm going to go through these more quickly now because we're going to run out of time. I'm helpful in guiding the class toward understanding course topics in the way that helps them clarify their thinking. And again, that deliberative dialogue gives a safe environment where they can talk about what they're thinking, how they're applying things, and so on, knowing that you're going to acknowledge and encourage them to keep doing that not by always telling them what's wrong with what they've said, but focusing on what's right and then perhaps offering some gentle corrections. Um, the, once you're on direct instruction, the most critical piece is to, for example, with assignments or exams, that feedback be, again, constructive um, and timely. That too is very important. I'm going to, before we're finished today, I'm going to give you a link to this assessment tool. And it gives you the opportunity to look at this yourself and do your own measurements. Say, you know, how often do I use this? Um, what else might I do? Um, I've, some of you may know this. Um, with some of my students, I've also been involved in looking more carefully at the role emotion plays in teaching and learning. And we, we have asked the question very loosely, is emotion the fourth presence? Um, but in speaking with the, the creator of this model, well, the three, uh, really Randy Garrison was the lead, but Terry Anderson and Walter Archer also participated in creating this. We initially, we defined emotional presence as the extent to which learners and teachers adapt their behavior to accommodate overt and covert presence of emotion. We have since identified that while not necessarily a separate presence, it's a ubiquitous presence. So this again is something that would take a lot longer than what we have today to go through carefully. But I, I can tell you that particularly with all the new evidence around brain science and the impact that emotional responses, stress, et cetera, can have on cognition that pedagogically, it's important for teachers to consider what's happening for their students emotionally. I know absolutely in Canada, and my understanding is it also an issue in the US, that the mental health of all of us, perhaps post pandemic, but I think like many other things, we were experiencing higher levels of mental health issues before the pandemic, and it only made it a lot worse. Okay, so our point around adding emotional presence is to give teachers the opportunity to consider in the first instance, at least acknowledging for the students that learning can be a very emotional, uh, in, uh, a very emotional experience. Um, there's stress, there's time, there's identity issues and so on. We do have indicators for emotional presence and these will be in the assessment tool I'm going to leave you with. We have over time, over much time, been able to identify that, um, that these six indicators map carefully to um, the other presences. So we suggest that um, in order for emotional presence to be a part of a community of inquiry, we as teachers need to acknowledge, support, and model expressions of emotional responses 
in text and oral presentations. Um, so I can say, not that I'm a teacher today, but that I'm very happy and very excited to be doing this. Um, you want to make explicit the use of emoticons and emotional language as part of the course learning environment. It's okay. It's okay to feel things. To ignore, encourage, acknowledge, and support expressions of emotion. That emotion is identified as a regular part of the human ex experience and that emotional experience and expression is shared among all members of a learning community to the extent that they feel comfortable. Nobody's gonna mandate that you make your education space like therapy. It's not that at all. It's that we want to give students that safe space where being authentic um, is okay up to a point. You can set the norms. We don't yell at each other. If we're angry, we, we ask for support to deal with it, et cetera. I mean, there are lots of ways to do that. I have had teachers say to me, I'm totally unprepared to deal with this. You do know that K to 12 teachers have to be trained to deal with this. We as university teachers don't have to. This is just one step in the direction of, of doing that, especially right now especially when we're adding the technology to what we're doing, especially post pandemic, that we at least present ourselves as real humans who actually do have emotional responses to things. And that we, we acknowledge um, and accept that sometimes emotions will be present, they might benefit the learning environment, and they may be a problem as well. Um, okay, these slides are going to go much quicker. In the creation of ways to teach in higher education, actually built on Chickering and Gamson's work of several decades ago. Again, if you're if you've been around for, for a few decades, they had a list of um, seven principles. We've adjusted those so they more readily acknowledge the technology, but they're also critical teaching tools for, high, for colleges and universities. Um, these are in a book that we wrote in 2013. It's being rewritten at the moment, but not a lot has changed, and these have stayed the same. Um, so I'm going to leave, leave these with you to review, but do, do consider in your design that you add open communication and critical reflection. Do consider that creating communities among learners, especially when you're using the technology and it's digital, can be really helpful in getting the students engaged and at their computers. Um, that you make the work with the content not just for digestion and regurgitation, but purposefully questions questioned and worked on um, to offer sustained collaboration through group projects, more dialogue, um, group discussion, etc. Make sure that you, you build your units with lots of active teaching and learning, but that you close them so that there isn't a lot of tattered edges hanging around. Um, and then finally, you may know about John Biggs's constructive alignment we need to make sure that assessment is congruent with the learning outcomes that we've agreed on with the students. Um, I can't go through this whole slide with you. I Please read this. We, we've done a significant um, research project on what in learning designers, instructors, leaders, et cetera, have said, what they think the challenges are to, to constructing a community of inquiry, especially in blended environments. The challenges they told us, this is, ah, um, oh, there are hundreds of respondents in this study, all people who took our, our MOOC on blended learning practice. For them, the challenges are lack of technical infrastructure, challenges for design, how do we do this? 
um, a lack of skill set, support, and training for the teachers, and lack of student motivation to participate. It can be harder to do more than just sit and listen and take notes. The benefits are increased interaction, more collaboration, increased accessibility and flexibility, increased social presence, and higher student engagement. The, I'll give you an example. I had a student when I taught this course, I, I taught a social issues course, so much fun, um, to undergraduates. And it was a blended environment. It was dialogic. It was active. Um, and two things happened. I had some guest speakers coming in, especially toward the end of the course. And the students were so good at asking questions, critiquing what was being said, saying what they thought. And the police chief, who I had come, took me aside afterwards and he said, I've never worked with a group before that's been this engaged and this active in their dialogue with me. Congratulations, I was so happy. Um, and several months after the end of this course, I ran into one of the students and he said, I have to tell you something. I really thought the way you were running that course was silly and really not very responsible on your part. Why didn't you create those lectures and just give us the stuff and let us write the exams and go, no, you weren't gonna, you weren't gonna let us get away with that. He said, I have to tell you, I talk about those issues all the time. I remember things. I, I, feel, I feel connected to those things that we worked on and talked about. So I give you that as, um, as some evidence that this is a way of engaging ourselves and students that's really valuable. Um, just some books that I can direct you to. This one, unfortunately, is not open source, um, but it's not an expensive paperback. And this is um, from 20, it actually came out in 2017. Um, and it's e-learning in the 21st century. This is Randy Garrison who created the community of inquiry model. And this book updates, the model was created in 2000. This book has a lot of updates on things that have to be remembered. Um, this is the book is, this book is open source. When you get the slides, if you click on it, you can download it chapter by chapter okay. through Athabasca University, it's free. And it, um, it makes these seven principles of teaching more explicit. Um, I work with a, a team of designers to create massive open online courses that are designed based on the community of inquiry. They're not MOOCs that just deliver content. They are communal experiences. And we do this through the Commonwealth of Learning. It goes all over the world. Um, and people come and get very actively involved you know, with the other students and with the material, with us. So we have a guide to blended learning that's open source. It has videos embedded in it. It's openly licensed. You, uh, with attribution, you can change it, you can shape it um, and use it. It's being used by uh, some universities in Canada as a way to help faculty and designers think about how to all the different ways you can blend face-to-face -face and online learning. Um, so I encourage you to download the book um, and consider taking the MOOC. We expect to run it again. It's also free. Uh, we expect to run it again late fall in 2020. Um, we're coming together to create the university and the and college, of course, of the future. And I offer you these things to read as things that I've picked out that I think are the most, are the clearest, most detailed, most thoughtful, most instructive about what we need to do as educators, not just to teach our own, our own subjects, but get involved in leading small l leading you don't have to be a vice president or a dean or a director we all need to lead the way forward to make education 
better for the diversity and the inequity that we need to fix. As you may know, Nelson Mandela was the one that said, if we're going to fix inequity in societies, we have to fix education. And I take him seriously. Um, this is another book that I highly recommend. It is, pieces of it are open. Um, what I like about what Marshall has said is he talks about bringing students together to make sense. And that means to make sense for themselves. And he also talks about technology as a catalyst for change. So it's a very good book. Um, last, I want to say, when you look at these slides, I've highlighted the things that I think we need most readily to, to integrate and work on to take us where, where we need to go. Um, take a look at these. When I said small L leadership, sit on some committees. Some of, if you're here today, you probably do this already, but sit on committees. This is, um, a taxonomy written by some Swedish researchers who looked at how institutions change and all the areas that have to change in order for us to get to a university of the future. So look at these last two slides and pick a place where you want to go and sit on a committee, have your voice heard, help um, small L leadership. We all need to lead this initiative. And then finally, I leave you with the question, um, how will you be designing and delivering courses three to five years from now? Thank you. I don't hear anyone talking. Here are, there are links to our MOOCs, I'm sorry, and links to the um, two assessments that I talked about. There's a learner assessment if you want the students partway through the course to assess whether there's a community of inquiry. And the other is a teaching assessment. They're free for you to use. They're openly licensed. There's no please give attribution to us who work so hard on them, but otherwise they're free. Thank you. I think am I, he's, he's uh, looking at me. All right. Well, Dr. Cleveland, um, thank you very much for the presentation and for the uh, extensive detail, if you will, on how uh, we can approach uh, the future, right? Uh, and what are the things that would be ideal for, for us in higher education to do? Jubel uh, I don't think we have any other questions um, from, from the audience. Uh, Anything, anything else, certainly we can follow up with Dr. Cleveland Inns via email. So we, we appreciate your time and your willingness to share uh, with the audience of heads uh, this important topic. So with that said, thank you everybody and have a good afternoon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, Dr. Cleveland. Yes, Bye -bye. can I stay to read the comments before I go? <laughs>